Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In 1926, Rudolf L. Hanna presented to the American Dental Association five factors, relative cusp height, compensating curve, conlar guidance, plane of orientation, and incisal guidance. These five factors he called the articulation quint. These five factors, when interrelated, can be applied to this Hanau H2 articulator and thereby achieve mechanical articulation. Mechanical articulation as such is the predisposing factor to balanced occlusion, which we see in the patient. This element of the articulator is called the condylar element. As you can see by the writing inscribed on this element of the articulator, it is called the horizontal condylar guidance. By loosening this bolt and this nut on the top part of the articulator, it then allows us to move this element in this fashion. When the patient's protrusive record is recorded and it is placed on the articulator, this part is moving in the posterior vicinity and this element is rotated until the record is interdigitated. It is then tightened and one may now read in this part of the articulator the actual mechanical uh, equivalent. This part of the articulator also rotates in this fashion by loosening the bolt down in this vicinity here it allows us to make such a movement. If we just turn the articulator here for a moment you can see these numbers registered at this part of the uh, instrument record this axis of rotation. This has been referred to as Bennett's angle. In the front part of the articulator we have this table here and this pin. This is called the incisal pin and this table is called the incisal table. It allows us to set and to establish by this mechanical equivalent, this mechanical equivalent down here, the incisal guide table angle. By tipping the articulator slightly and loosening this bolt on the bottom of the instrument, one can now rotate this table in an anterior and a posterior direction, allowing you to set the mechanical equivalent for the incisal angle. This is an anterior posterior reading or the horizontal incisal angle. The lateral incisal angle is set by elevating this platform by way of this uh, nut bolt extension. One can do that again by simply raising the articulator and uh, gently extending this small uh, bolt here which allows you to elevate the lateral wing of the incisal guide table. In this position uh, one then picks up the anterior posterior component of the incisal movement as well as the lateral uh, component. We therefore have discussed on this articulator two of the five elements in Hanos Quint. The condylar mechanism which is completely dictated by the patient's protrusive check bite and the incisal guidance, which can be set on the articulator from the way that we arrange the upper and the lower anterior teeth. Now, the other three factors in Hanau's Quint, the plane of orientation, the relative cusp height, and the compensating curve, these are factors which take place and are developed within the, the central confines of this articulator, within this area here therefore becomes extremely important uh, where we locate the maxillary and the mandibular cast. And as you know, that is one of the reasons for taking the face bow transfer. It allows us to position the cast in relationship to the condylar mechanism of the articulator. Again, as a review, these five factors that Hanau has presented to us are extremely important in articulation, and one must utilize this instrument 
to its fullest capabilities in order to achieve bilateral balanced articulation. We see before us five different posterior teeth from one manufacturer representing different occlusal morphologies. The two teeth here in the front represent anatomical teeth followed by these two which represent non-anatomic teeth and this third which represents the flat plane or the zero degree rational posterior tooth. This front tooth which is an example of an anatomic tooth has many many sulci, cusps, spillways in its occlusal morphology which are indicative of a natural posterior tooth. The non-anatomic tooth has a specific design to its occlusal surface also. However, its occlusal surface is based on mechanical principles and on geometrical design with only a slight amount of attention paid to uh, anatomical form as compared to a natural tooth. The rational tooth or the zero degree tooth is carved based on a philosophy of occlusion with little attention given to cusp height, uh, mechanical articulation, or geometrical design. These teeth were hand carved by various people. The tooth on this side being first carved in 1909 by Dr. Giese, followed very closely by this 20 degree tooth, again by Dr. Giese, and thirdly followed by this Pilkington Turner tooth or the 30 degree posterior. This other non-anatomic tooth that we see represented over here is called a functional tooth and it is very, there's very little difference between this tooth and the original tooth designed by Dr. Giese other than a reduction of the cusp height. This tooth, the 33 degree posterior designed by Dr. Giese in 1909, was the first scientifically designed posterior tooth. Its occlusal morphology is based on solid geometry. It was designed on an articulator that was an inversion system with small cutters used to carve the occlusal surface. Dr. Giese utilized solid geometry in the design of this tooth using the five factors which were originally described by Dr. Hanoff. And it is those five factors which we must move and, and adjust in order to arrive at balanced articulation. The 33 degree posterior tooth was the first scientifically designed posterior artificial tooth. It was constructed on a cutting instrument which was very similar in design to this Hano H2 articulator. Dr. Giese utilized the five controlling end factors in designing the tooth, the first being the horizontal condylar guidance. Now I've taken the liberty to set this articulator similarly to those figures utilized by Dr. Giese. He had a 30 degree horizontal condylar guidance. He had a lateral condylar guidance of 15 degrees and he established an incisal guidance of 30 degrees in the anterior posterior dimension. What took place in the intersection or the middle confines of the cutting instrument are described in the other three end controlling factors. You will notice that this articulator is a represents an equilateral triangle being 110 millimeters from this condylar element to this condylar element and that the central incisors would form the midpoint or the third point of the equilateral uh, triangle. This equilateral triangle has been well described in the literature by Dr. Bonwell. The other factor in the five laws or the five factors involved in governing articulation is the plane of orientation. If one measures from the horizontal condylar guidance down 
to the mid portion of this H on the manufacturer's name, Hanau, we will note that this is exactly 33 millimeters from the transverse axis on this articulator. It was at this height in this mid space here that Dr. Giese located his carving materials to dis design the occlusal surface of the tooth. At this height, he placed cutting instruments, which you see described and designated here. Large instruments to cut the molar occlusal morphology, the smaller to cut the bicuspid morphological surface. These cutting blades or tools were placed in the mid portion of this articulator at the 33 millimeter height. The cutting tools were also positioned with a very specific compensating curve. And then the articulator, or cutting tool if you will, was moved through its various movements, working, balancing, uh, protrusive, thereby cutting on the clay a specific primordial form. And that primordial form we see represented here. It has very, very specific angulations dictated by the geometry of the cutting system. From the primary or primordial forms, Dr. Giese then carved the occlusal surface of the 33 posterior tooth, placing the spillways, the various grooves, etc., to make from this primordial form a representation of a natural anatomical tooth. Therefore, we see that the teeth were carved in block, four uh, teeth, with a very specific curve and the resultant angulation of the tooth is extremely specific. If we look at this large model that we have here of the 33 degree posterior tooth as designed by Dr. Giese, we see that the anatomy of this particular tooth is very, very specific and the various angles throughout its occlusal surface are deep and are designed with a thought towards geometry and with a thought towards efficiency and natural tooth form. You see before you a left mandibular first molar, a Pilkington Turner 30 degree tooth. The occlusal surface of this tooth is designed and based on mechanical principles with solid geometry being utilized. When one articulates with this mandibular first molar, its antagonist, the maxillary first molar, we arrive at an interdigitation in which the mesial lingual cusp fits into the central sulcus. If the patient now, or if on the articulator, a left working movement is made the maxillary antagonist passes over the occlusal surface in this manner, in which the lingual cusp passes through the groove to the lingual surface of the lower molar. A working movement to the right side, whereby this left side now becomes the balancing side, results in the mesial lingual cusp passing up the distal buccal groove of this lower molar in this particular fashion. And this is the balancing contact that results in a balancing movement. In a pure protrusive movement, the mesial lingual cusp travels up the distal lingual incline of this lower molar in this manner. These pathways that this maxillary molar follows in working, in balancing, and in protrusion are based on the movements of the articulator. They were designed in the occlusal surface of this tooth based on the passage of the cutting tool and in the creation of the various angulations in the primordial form. If we trace on the occlusal surface of this tooth, the pass of movement that the mesial lingual cusp made over the occlusal surface of this tooth, 
we find that this line would represent the working movement. This line here would represent the balancing movement. Any line drawn from this dot into the central sulcus would represent the protrusive movement. Actually, what you see represented here is a Gothic arch configuration. But you should realize that it is an extremely specific Gothic arch configuration. It is one whose angles, working, balancing, and protrusive, are designed and are specific for the Pilkin and Turner 30 degree posterior tooth. If we now take this wire mobile, which fits into the depths of this tooth to conform to the Gothic arch configuration, we find that this metal arrangement has a very specific spatial relationship. It fits on this particular tooth. It was designed with end controlling factors, counter guidance and incisal guidance, both horizontal and lateral, being very specific. It only stands to reason then that unless we use this particular tooth for that spatial and geometrical articulator relationship, we will then achieve our balanced articulation and only then. If on the other hand, we were to use a different tooth, in this instance, the 20 degree posterior tooth, in which our condylar and, and incisal guidance are specific for the 33 degree tooth. If we now take this metal mobile and place it on the occlusal surface of this tooth, we find that when we attempt to achieve a working relationship, that the balancing element is elevated. If we seat the balancing element, we then find that the working and the protrusive angulations do not fit properly. The point that this should bring to your attention is the fact that we cannot tip or rotate the tooth to achieve the necessary cusp to fossa to guiding plane relationship. We must alter the occlusal surface of this tooth by very careful selective grinding. And then, and only then, will we be able to achieve the balanced articulation, which then leads to balanced occlusion. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.